great communication is about more than just overcoming stage fright. Now, I grew up in the theater, performing in plays and musicals, while my guests grew up performing improv and connecting with his spontaneity and creativity in a whole new way. This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 396, High Performance Communication and Improv with Dave Delaney. Good morning, I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My guest today is an author, corporate trainer, keynote speaker, and host of the NICE podcast. He helps fast-growing companies reach their people through comprehensive communication workshops and presentations. His book, New Business Networking, explores online and offline tools, tips, and techniques to grow and nurture your professional network for your business and career by communicating the nice way. And now here is my interview with Dave Delaney. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Let's just discuss, first of all, the elephant in the room, which is that you are Canadian. No. <laughs> <laughs> it is, true. It no, is true. I only bring that up because you have a brand about being nice and everything I know about Canada and I've been to Canada. I love it is that there are nice people in Canada. So tell me about your Canadian heritage that makes you so nice. <laughs> well, you know, there are jerks in Canada, too. I hate to, <laughs> I hate to, to share that little nugget. Uh, but yeah, sadly they're everywhere. There's a certain sort of humbleness in being Canadian that's ingrained in your DNA. And I think it's something similar to like Kiwis from New Zealand or, uh, you know, Irish people, uh, which I have a lot of experience with living in Ireland for a couple of years. And I think it is, of course, not geographically speaking, but as far as population goes, when you live in, a, when you're the smaller kid on the block, um, you know, and Canada is a relatively small country population wise compared to the US, and you have kind of a louder, bigger brother next to you who's really loud, <laughs> <laughs> you just become sort of more uh, laid back a little bit, more humble. And so I think there is uh, something, although I haven't seen any research on this, but I think there are similarities in, um, in, in that, in that, you know, like Ireland has Britain kind of over it, uh, you know, New Zealand has Australia over it and Canada has the U S over it. So I, I think there is something to that. Um, and, and to a side on that as well, there was obviously amazing American humor, American comedians, American comedy, sketch comedy shows, and, and, and on and on. However, I read a book years ago. My dad bought me. I used to study improv and perform improv. And my dad bought me this book comparing Canadian humor to American humor and or, or why Canadian humor was really good humor. Um, and what it came down to, or the thesis of, of the book, was that Canadians they make fun of themselves a lot more than Americans do. Mm. And, and they get that sort of a self-deprecation thing. And they get that from the British influence, but then Canadian comedians are also very observational, like a lot of American comedians are. And so Canadians get sort of the, the best influences from American humor and, and uh, British humor. And those two influences combined make Canadians uh, pretty funny. Yeah, so certainly. I, I think I, I think it's great. I know one of the the things that you are, I guess, known for now is like is you know the improv background leading to mm. communication, which leads to this whole like I guess an aura around the work that you're doing now, which is what I want to mostly focus on today, especially from this perspective of of kind of nice. And let's go with what, first of all, what is the nice method? This is a thing that you are working with, and I want to know more about that and then how that plays into kind of what you're doing today. Right. So the nice method is a series of presentations that I do and training that I do for different organizations. And what I realized over the years, kind of taking a step back and whiteboarding all of the content I have, the themes, the topics I talk about, I write about, I podcast about, and they all come down to this idea of, of being nice and, and, and being more effective in the way you communicate. And so my goal um, with my, my presentations, my keynote talks, my, you know, lunch and learns virtually and all these things that I do for organizations. My goal is always to, to bring people together. That's why I wrote a book about networking, new business networking, because what I want to do is try to find ways to improve relationships, 
um, um, improve communication. And that's a big step in that and, and doing it in a nice sort of methodology, a nice sort of framework. And that's, that's what I use to uh, either consulting with organizations and leadership teams or whether it's through um, my podcast or through presentations as well. So what does that mean to be nice in this sense? Because I know that the way that I kind of have viewed communication and one thing that I have seen that plays out a lot is that the people that you know you can get along with well are the ones you want to work with more often. I mean, mm. I think to a large degree, that's why you and I are friends and why you're on the show today is that like I want to talk to you. I want there to be that relationship. Like, how does that play into, I guess, whether it's our, our personalities or our just like our general demeanor? Is that a, a, like a valuable aspect to what it means to effectively communicate or to to get things done? Absolutely. I think it's a matter of, you know, um, so I have a talk that I do right now um, that's become quite popular and it's called the ROI of nice. And the idea in the ROI of nice is to focus on yourself first and, and improving the way you are personally. Um, and then, and then helping stakeholders. So those in your organization, your, your colleagues, your clients and so forth, and then your, and then society as a whole and how to give back in, in nice ways. And so to that first point about self, it's really recognizing your own strengths. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of, of personality assessments, um, you know, and, and in doing these over the years, I've learned so much about myself and, and not so much learning about myself, but really recognizing and realizing, whoa, these are my strengths. And so part of that is, you know, one of the strengths that I think we all need to be uh, aiming for is to come across, not just come across nice and then stab someone in the back, uh, <laughs> but actually be nice. And part of that is just laying down framework, like, like, you know, one thing that I've talked to my kids about through their whole lives is the golden rule, right? Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's, it's such a simple thing. But when you think about it, like if, if you treat people with respect, if you treat people on a level playing field, if you're, if you're cool to people, basically, then they're going to be cool back to you. So that's, it sounds, again, it sounds like a simple thing, but it often gets overlooked or it gets missed. So how do you build that into, I guess, with the work that you're doing? I, I mean, both of us are, are podcasters, we're speakers. I, do you leverage this this concept of being nice as a way to, uh, not to say get more business, but as a way to like relate to the people that you're working with or a way to to find common ground? Or how does like your personality play into, like, I'm going to like leverage my niceness uh, to benefit others and to make things work? Yeah, I mean... You know, at the end of the day, many of us, uh, and, you know, your listeners have businesses, right? So you're trying to make money, <laughs> right? You're trying to retain clients, retain employees and so forth. Um, so, you know, it, it's absolutely essential uh, in the work that you do the, that that the way you treat people, the, the, the way that you come off to people, they're more likely to choose to do business with you. The old line, people do business with those they know, like and trust. And, and so by creating content and sort of being out there, people get to know you, right. And, and by being cool and treating people well, um, they like you. And, and from that, they, they start to trust you. And then ultimately they choose to do business with you, or that's what you hope at least. Certainly. And, and how does that play in with your, the workshops that you do? I know that there's a lot of like teamwork in terms of how people relate, like in an organization, let's say like in, in a, in a team environment. Yeah. How does that play into how people interact day to day? Because I know that one thing that I, I mean, I work for myself now, but I've been on part of you know, day jobs and teams in the past where I, I didn't necessarily like the people I was working with and mm. being nice was a challenge. And so right. how does that play into kind of that, the, the office culture or we're going to, to build a team that where things are effective there? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, there's different things uh, to it. So basically when I speak to, uh, you know, a prospect or a potential client, I, you know, I want to determine, first of all, if I'm a good fit for their organization. Uh, and then if, if I am and what I have to, you know, this nice methodology, then I determine like what their concerns are, what their issues are um, and what they're trying to improve. And based on that, I build out, um, a, a, you know, a, a plan. Um, and then develop and, and deliver that plan. And that engage, en engages the employees. It gets everybody together. So an example of this 
is I had a client who was a fast growing uh, technology healthcare company. And they were running into what fast growing companies run into. And I've worked at two of them. So I've learned this firsthand growing pains, right? Where, you, you know, if you're an earlier employee, especially, um, suddenly there's all these new people uh, showing up t- uh, to the desks around you and, and you start to, you know, communication starts to falter. So, uh, so this was a, a concern for a company that hired me. So what I did was I did a workshop, um, and in this workshop specifically, I actually uh, brought in a lot of elements of improv and the things that I know from performing and studying improv with Second City in Toronto and performing improv on my own and over the years here in Nashville and, you know, in Ireland and other places. And what I did was I put together this this really fun, you know, half-day program where um, I gave everybody badges and I color coordinated the badges so that, or color coded the ba- badges so that I would, I would know what department they were with. So green was marketing, blue was IT, you know, and so forth. And um, because part of it was that these departments were becoming kind of islands and nobody knew other people from other departments. And that was part of the objective of this was to bring them together. So I could see from the, the, the colors of their badges that I could, I could pair them up in different, uh, different activities. And what came from something that that was amazing was I'm going to generalize here. Generally speaking, salespeople are quite outgoing, Mm -hmm. extroverted and developers are more introverted and quieter. Generally speaking. Now, what happened here was, um, a salesperson, I partnered a salesperson with an, uh, with a developer and, the salesperson was shocked. In fact, the whole company was shocked at how outgoing uh, and charismatic this uh, developer was because they always thought, I mean, he's just great at uh, doing what he does. And so he, he had headphones on buried behind a monitor all day and nobody realized how great he was in this way. So the salesperson started bringing him on calls, on sales calls, when he was meeting with, um, you know, uh, CIOs and, and, and you know, uh, information types. Um, and in doing this, because the salesperson couldn't talk about, you know, how the, how the sausage was made specifically. Uh, and so this, this IT professional or developer came with him on calls and the developer could very eloquently speak about how that sausage is made. And as a result, they ended up closing many new clients uh, because of this. So again, this gets into the way we communicate, um, but it also gets into tapping into our own strengths and recognizing those strengths uh, so that they can play a role, uh, you know, in the organization. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. There's definitely a lot of people who don't fit the mold for the typical kind of, you know, the IT person or the salesperson. Right. Uh, to that degree, I mean, you mentioned that improv has been a big influence for you. I, mean, I spent many years doing theater. I have a degree in theater. I know that that really played a lot into, I mean, to a certain degree, why I'm a podcaster, why I'm a speaker. I think for the same degree for you as well. How do you think that performance plays into, I guess, your ability to communicate or to relate to people or to, to form that connection there? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a crucial part. Um, and whether that performance, and I don't, I don't mean, by, you know, faking something, right. but, but, but by delivering information in a way that people can retain that information is essential in a sales call, but even, you know, or if you're standing on a stage in front of an audience, or if you're a company who is trying to raise uh, funding and you need to pitch investors, we've all, you know, seen, uh, uh, Oh gosh, here's the Canadian in me. <laughs> I always mix up the, the shark tank with dragon's den. Uh, Dragon's Den is the Canadian Shark Tank. So oh, I always I didn't know go that. to I, yeah, 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 and I always go to Dragon's Den first. So that's funny. Um, but you know, so you know those kind of high stakes uh, right. sessions where you've got to do a good job presenting. Um, so performance is a very important uh, part of that, and it's not just in uh, communicating. It is about communicating points, like key points. Um, and, and pulling out or extracting content that may be just too much for the, for the audience or the, the person that you're training. I do a lot of training, uh, virtually and, you know, I worked with an organization, uh, well, before pandemic, uh, who had a company retreat here in Nashville and they were looking, they were, uh, 12 different trainers from across the country for an organization. So they hired me to do a half day training for them on presentation skills. 
Um, and I actually was able to review their their decks, their content, and teach them some really great ways to to deliver this content more creatively and more effectively. Um, and that definitely tapped into using um, improv. In fact, we we ran through some improv uh, workshop in, improv uh, exercises as we did that. Yeah, I mean, for me, I've noticed it's a huge difference between like viewing what you're doing as I mean, not a performance, but viewing that the work that you're doing as a way to yeah present something in a way that someone else is really going to be engaged with what you're doing. I mean, I yeah. think that was really for me what I took away from my background doing a lot of theater was that when I was you know doing a sales call, when I was you know, in front of an audience, like I want them to to care about what I'm saying. I think that takes a certain it's, it's, it's an art form essentially to get them to really buy into kind of what you're presenting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They need to care. And, and that gets into defining what the problem is that you're trying to solve, um, which is why what I mentioned before about the initial conversations that I have with my, my potential clients is finding out exactly what their, their problems are, making sure that I'm the right fit, I'm the right solution for them, or you know, my team at Futureforth. Um, and, and then finding out from there, you know, how, uh, how success would be in the eyes of the audience or, or whoever it is that I'd be speaking to, whether it's a keynote presentation or whether it's a, you know, a training session for a team. Where do you think that most people struggle the most when it comes to communication? Like, are they lacking confidence in communicating? Is it a skill set gap? Like, where are they, are they really lacking the most when it comes to wanting to, to communicate well? Yeah, great question. And I think a big part of it is the uh the inability or to listen effectively. Mm. Um and I find that that is one way that I I notice um that comes up a lot. And and one thing that I talk about with listening and and it's part of of some of the the training that I do and it's definitely part of the the presentations that I do as well is that when you are not listening to someone, uh it it's pretty obvious. <laughs> um mm -hmm. So it's interesting too. like, listen, the word listen itself is an anagram for the word silent. Hmm. So mix up those letters and it works out as listen and or silent, depending which way you're doing it. Uh, so it, it's amazing to me that it's right there in front of us, uh, uh, albeit mixed up. And I think that if you are, or uh, if when you are listening effectively, um, you are often quiet um, I always use this, this example of, you know, going to a conference, remember conferences, Jeff. Oh yeah. What are those <laughs> <laughs> good old conferences, but remember like you go to a conference or a networking event or a mixer or something like that. And you meet somebody and you're like, gosh, I really like this person. She was really, really nice. And you get back and you're thinking about, you know, the conversation you had or whatever. And then you think like, what was her name? Ah, I can't remember her name. Well, she worked at, oh, I don't know where she worked. Well, she did. Uh, I don't remember what she did. <laughs> you don't remember any of this information, but you really liked her a lot. And the reason why you liked her so much is because she let you do the bulk of the talking because mm. we all like to talk about you know ourselves. And so when you do the bulk or when you allow the person to do the bulk of the talking, um, that makes them feel better about you because they're able to share whatever's on their mind. So I do a lot of work around listening. And, uh, and it's something by the way, that nobody is perfect at. It's something that I'm often, you know, working on myself, uh, you know, uh, but, but being aware of this, uh, of, of this really important thing, uh, and being more mindful of it, it really does help. I mean, the first thing that I think of when, when I think of listening is how much I don't listen to, like, I don't know, like my wife, for example, like I get called out frequently for not being fully present. I think it's, it's interesting because that that level of engagement when you're listening, like it's a full body experience where you really have to give yourself to a full conversation. I think that to that degree, it requires a real like energy and willingness to be present, which I think for most of us is hard because we're distracted or just not fully engaged. And I think it really takes like a willingness to, to give extra effort. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, to my point about me not being a perfect listener, yeah, it is Heather, my wife, who would be the first to let you know that yeah, he, he hasn't figured it all out yet. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. 
Um, yeah, I guess from that perspective, too, it's like we think about people who are trying to communicate effectively. We all have kind of our own weaknesses. Like, How do you recommend people to, like, I guess, be, have more self-awareness around where they can improve? Like, Does it require uh, going to a, a, a conference or a workshop or does, is there a way for us to identify on our own? You know, here's where I struggle and here's how I can improve. Well, I think the first thing is, you know, and, and talking about the ROI of NICE, you know, part of that, that framework, as I mentioned, is self, right? So it's recognizing and understanding yourself. And I go through different exercises about this, but, but one of them is taking a personality assessment, hmm. you know, whether it's Enneagram or, you know, StrengthsFinder or DISC assessments, whatever it is, take, take one of these assessments. I highly recommend it. There's freebies you can do online as well. Um, but what you find out from these assessments is what your top strengths are. And again, as I said before, this is something that you, you really, you, you will not be shocked by the results typically, but they confirm to you what you, what you already knew. So for example, my number one strength is communication and my number two is consistency. Number three is woo. Number four is activator and number five is harmony. Now I won't go into the whole 30 or 50 or however many there are, but those are my top five and I have them. I know them off the top of my head, but I also have them pinned above my desk on the wall and I have them there so I can refer back to them throughout the day so that when I'm writing a blog post or I'm, you know, editing a podcast or delivering, putting together a podcast or talking to a client, if what I'm doing doesn't fit into these strengths, like I'm terrible with numbers. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm really bad at accounting and, and all that stuff. It doesn't mean that I can't you know, get better at that, but I have to recognize that that's not one of my strengths. And so by recognizing what your strengths actually are, you can then get uh, assistance, get help with the stuff that is you know, lower down on the list and that, that go down to the weaknesses even to, to tap into people who who are successful or excellent at these weaker points. And then that really does balance things out. And so this is why this is so important and done so often. And I do this as well with my clients is to try to drill down and figure out exactly what their strengths are and then tap into those tr strengths in the work that you do, because that's, that's, what's going to ultimately, uh, you know, you're going to do best. Yeah, certainly. I know I took a, a, an assessment some years ago that told me that I was a, like a goal achieving person. And that was like an aspect of me. And mm. as soon as I was able to label that as like, you know, this test told me I'm this, like I really identified with that. And it really has stuck with me ever since, like to the degree that I, that's really how I view myself. It's in a large way how I view the listeners of this podcast. It's how I view, like, the people I want to connect with tend right. to align to what these tests tell me about myself. I think it's really interesting that those, they, they really do confirm your suspicions about what you're great at and what you care about, how you operate. And that knowledge is really powerful. You can then you know, put into a lot of different areas of your life. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing, like, uh, you know, part of my goal with, with everything I do is I want to make people nicer, you know, and mm. as I said to themselves, um, obviously in their organizations who, you know, I work with and, and the keynotes and, and things that I do, but I want you to take it and, and, and put it to use, you know, outside of the conference or outside of the organization back at home or when you're hanging out with friends or making new friends, um, this, you know, I, there's so many, you know, key things here. I tell my kids, my kids are 14 and 15 and I tell them like when they start dating, which they can't date for the next 20 to 30 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I tell them like when they start dating and they go out on a date with somebody, always note how your date treats the server at the mm. restaurant you're at. Um, and, and you can, that's a red flag right there. If, if the person that you are with treats the server, you know, rudely or doesn't look at them or anything like that, you know, that's a red flag right there for you to say, uh, okay, this person's kind of a jerk. Even though they may be <laughs> acting, you know, all lovely to you, you can tell like, wait a minute, they're treating the server like a jerk. So, um, so that's just like one of those little, you know, little ways that you, that can help. Yeah, very true. Very true. Um, I want to shift gears here just slightly because I know that you have a new podcast out and I want to be sure we talk about that because this is one thing that, you know, I love podcasts, obviously, we're on one now, uh, but I also <laughs> want to hear like more about like what, are, what, what kind of work are you doing on your, your new show? 
Yeah, thanks for asking. So the Nice Podcast is at nicepodcast.co, uh, nicepodcast.co. And the the podcast is about, uh, it's a leadership podcast uh, for leaders who want to improve how they are nice to themselves, how effective they are, you know, the work that they do. Um, and so it's geared around collaboration and communication, but also community and kindness. And, and, and it, so it revolves all around that stuff, but I've, um, yeah, you know, for years, for the last few years, I've considered myself a recovering podcaster. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I started podcasting with my wife in 05 and we had the second parenting podcast ever, uh, from 2005 to 2008. Um, and I've had a handful of other podcasts over the years. Some I've done for, for others and some I've done for myself. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big, uh, fan of the medium, and, uh, and so the goal of this podcast is really, yeah, just to spread the word and, and to get folks to be more effective in the work they do and the way they lead, uh, and being nicer to, to themselves and to the other people in their lives that like part of this too, by the way, I, I sometimes tell people that, that my podcast is like a, a self-help podcast disguised as a business podcast, mm. <laughs> right? Um, because the whole thing with leadership is is also one of those kind of gray words. It's these gray areas because it's like, well, I'm not a leader. I just work, you know, in a department doing my thing. But or or I'm a self-employed person. I just work by myself. You know, I'm not really a leader. But the truth is that everybody is a leader in one way or another. And and well, so so this is this is part of the the talk that I do with the ROI of nice of realizing myself like how I was a leader when I was much younger without actually realizing it until a friend like 30 years later told me, <laughs> I was wow. like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, so uh, it's important to understand that we're all sort of leaders and we can all lead, uh, you know, by treating people the way they want to be treated and, and so on. So, so the podcast has been, you know, I'm on episode 11 right now. Episode 12 will drop on Monday. So it's definitely got that fresh uh, new podcast smell to it. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, uh, yeah, the feedback's been great so far and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to share it with more folks. All right. We're going to shift gears again. This one a little more intensely. Um, I want to ask you about something I saw on social media, which is that you had posted recently that you had gone 10 months without alcohol. And I'm curious to hear the story behind that as far as what actually caused you to make that change. Uh, what, what kind of impact have you seen from that? Tell us the story behind uh, your shift to, to let go of alcohol. Yeah. So what happened was um, it was during, during early. Well, okay. So I, I quit drinking uh, June 8th um, of last year. And I didn't intentionally quit drinking, nor do I know for sure if I have forever. I don't know. Huh. Um, apparently Guinness is working on a 0% uh, non-alcoholic Guinness. Oh my and, gosh. And if they master that, then the next trip I go to Ireland will, uh, will keep me uh, sober. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, failing that, eh, if I'm going to Ireland, I'm having a pint of Guinness. I'm sorry. Um, last summer, we had a lot of things going on right? We had mm -hmm. the pandemic. Um, uh, we had a lot of, uh, unrest, civil unrest in the U S, um, and around the world. Um, a lot of tensions were high. Um, and then in, in, in addition to this, um, my family and I were displaced for three months, um, because our house, uh, well, well <laughs> backing up three months, as you know, in Nashville, uh, last March, March, third, 2020, a tornado roar through, roared through and, and, uh, did a lot of damage. My kid's school was destroyed in the, mm. and that was pretty emotional. Fast forward May 3rd of last year. And that's when we had another storm and 10 holes in our roof. Um, and so we were unable to live at our home and I, I don't wish this on anyone dealing with insurance companies and contractors mm. becomes a full-time job. So it became this incredibly stressful time. And that is when I, and I'd been, I was drinking a little too much. I wouldn't say I was, I wasn't getting drunk or anything, but I was certainly having, you know, drinks every night kind of thing to, to unwind. And I was like, I got to cool off. So I decided I'm going to take 30 days off drinking and then 30 became 60 and 60 became 90. And, and here we are almost, you know, a little over 10 months. Um, I should add, by the way, 
uh, no product placement here, but, uh, but if it wasn't for well-being brewing, uh, I don't know if I would have been able to pull it off. <laughs> um, I have to say for those of you who are listening, who are thinking about, you know, who love beer and are thinking about, you know, taking a break for a bit, um, there are amazing zero or very, very close, uh, to 0%, uh, alcohol beers now. And like well-being is a brewery I, I found. Again, I'm not, I have no relation with this brewery. Um, but they brew non-alcoholic beers. And and they have IPAs, they have stouts, they have blah, blah, blah. They have and they have really good beer. So, you know, in the things that I normally would do, you know, if I go to the beach with friends, uh, you know, drink a lot of beer sitting on the beach all day. I, I we did that and I brought all this non-alcoholic beer with me and it was perfect. <laughs> it was great. Uh, so yeah, 10 months, 10 months. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, recently on, on the podcast, I was talking with my wife, actually, we had just recently, and we we're talking about different like dietary habit changes we made mostly during the pandemic. And yes. one of those that I shifted to was drinking. Basically, I had no alcohol for about two months. And mm. now I'm on like a very low amount. It's like maybe like one drink a week. Uh, right. Whereas previously it was every night. It was multiple drinks a night. And like mm -hmm. I saw in myself like this, if this habit continues, like I don't like where it's going. Like this is not the me I want to be. So I'm, uh, I'm always yeah. curious when I see someone else who makes a similar shift, whether it's due to, you know, there was stress and you had to make a change or whether you just saw bad habits. It's interesting to see like how those kind of personal habit choices play out and how they affect our day to day. So I think it's really amazing that you have made that uh, work for you for such a long time. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm no expert in addiction, um, but there, you know, I mean, I do know, uh, alcoholics and former alcoholics and, and, uh, you know, and that's just, that's just booze. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've had friends OD over the years. I've had friends, you know, mm. I used to smoke like a chimney What? Um, over 20 years ago. Wow. And, um, I tried quitting many times, many, many times and many failed attempts. Uh, and I tried all sorts of different ways. Um, but ultimately it came down to me going, uh, leaving Ireland and going home for Christmas one year and decided, uh, and I decided during that time I would be with family and none of them, none of them smoked. So I wouldn't be around anyone smoking. So I thought, okay, this is my chance since I'm not around anyone smoking to just give it a, give it my best shot again. And yeah, I haven't had a drag of a cigarette in over 20 years. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, addiction is one of those, those tricky things. I mean, you know, I drank, like I, I used to drink a lot back in the nineties and, you know, early two thousands for sure. And it really wasn't until, um, it wasn't really until I got married, but also that I, you know, had kids, um, that I was like, you know, I need to, I need to, you know, chill out here a bit. So but yeah, so 10, 10 plus months, it's, uh, yeah, it's been good. It's been good. What do you think is the impact for you in terms of that, in terms of like how you view your health or how it affects your productivity? Like what is the impact for you in terms of that? I guess I know that the biggest issue that I've seen with myself is that if I choose to drink more often, it just tends to lead to that downward spiral of I'm getting a little less done. I don't quite have my energy I used to. Like I just, I'm not up to hundred percent. Like how does that affect you? Yeah. Um, well, you know, as you get older, um, and I just had a birthday, so I'm getting, I, I'm very much mindful of this, <laughs> uh, but as you, as you get older, you, um, uh, alcohol does, you know, it just, the hangovers last way longer and they, mm. and they come from less consumption. You drink two beers and feel like crap for two days. So, um, so there's that I, I, I found that I sleep better um, and, and snored less. I'm still working on that. <laughs> uh, um, and so there's that. I also tend to do things in a kind of combined effort, not always intentionally, but I've also started working with a trainer. My wife and I both started working with a trainer, um, uh, who's actually a family member and she's virtually training us. And so we've bought some equipment. And so we've been, we've been working out pretty steadily, uh, since last July um, you, typically five days a week is what we're going for. And so in doing that combined with not drinking, I'm like, yeah, I'm feeling great. Um, years ago, my wife and I decided we're going to quit drinking for 30 days, start jogging, which we didn't do before and go vegan, uh, for 30 days. 
And, uh, and that, that was like another one of those experiments that, you know, after 30 days, we're like, hell no, we we're like <laughs> pizza and beer. And we felt like we were going to die after that pizza and beer, I, I tell you. But, um, but that was also like a really, that was a great ex experience because we actually tracked, um, our, our, uh, our stats and actually found that the results of that were pretty, pretty impressive. So, uh, so I mean, I've been, I've been a vegan, vegan for over 10 years. So that's right. That's yeah. right. I forgot about that. Yes. Yes. So there's definitely a big, uh, a big plus in, in being vegan for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's always, I, I love the idea of doing kind of those 30 day experiments to see what happens. I think it's, there's so much you can learn in just a single month of trying something new and it can teach you like either a, this is a good fit for me long term, or I'm sick of this. I'm moving back to my old habits, but I think right. I, either way you learn a lot about yourself and the kind like the way that you want to live. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just, you know, realizing that, okay, maybe a pitcher of beer and a pizza right after being vegan for 30 days is probably a poor choice. <laughs> uh, cause it certainly was for us, but it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, when I used to smoke, um, <laughs> when I was in Ireland, there was this pack of, there's this brand of cigarettes in Ireland called, I think they're called majors and they're majorly disgusting. Like they're <laughs> super, super strong. And so in order to try to convince myself to quit, I would buy majors and try to smoke those just to make myself feel worse. Um, <laughs> which was the stupidest thing. That's, that's and, funny. Uh, by the way, that doesn't work in oh. case anyone's thinking. Good to know. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's one strategy to make things happen. Yes. Um, there's another kind of topic I tend to ask my guests. I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this too, which is, you know, this being the 5A miracle, I want to hear more about kind of daily habits that you have today, especially those around, you know, the way you begin your day with your morning routine. Do you have anything that you like to do every day that kind of sets you off to say today will be productive, today will be successful? Um, what do you do to kind of establish the foundation there? Yeah. So, you know, Atomic Habits is a good book worth reading. Of course, your, your book as well is a wonderful book on, on, uh, you know, establishing these morning, uh, habits and, and just establishing habits. Um, and, uh, I just, uh, I've been trying to do different things. So, um, uh, well, I already mentioned working out, so I've, I'm trying to work out much, you know, five days a week, some days it's three days, <clears throat> but I, I don't usually go less than three most weeks it's four or five days. Um, so working out is important. Um, I think having small successes earlier in the day can help, you know, you know, help you have a more successful, productive day. So, um, reading more for me because I've got the podcast now I'm, I'm having guests on more frequently. So I'm trying to read their books before they come on which helps me, you know, obviously reading is, you know, I don't have to tell you guys why reading is, is so important. <laughs> um, so reading more, writing more. Um, uh, another thing I've been doing again is journaling and I'm, and I just had a birthday, as I mentioned. So I'm, I'm, I've set a goal of writing a journal entry every day for the year. Um, it can be short, it can be long or not a goal, sorry, a journal entry. Um, but uh, I just had Jeffrey Shaw, Jeff Shaw on my podcast, to, um, who wrote The Self-Employed Life, which is a book coming out soon. He was great. Like, mm. Definitely someone you should, you should uh, talk to on your show. And he, um, he in his book, recommends, um, and we talked about this on the podcast, uh, um, a what's going right uh, as a journal entry. And, and the idea here, so I kind of took it and, and kind of changed it a little bit for me. But wh what I'm doing is writing what's going right in my journal every day. That's what I'm leading with. And that little move has really helped me, um, focus more on the positive things that are, that are going on. Um, I've struggled, especially during the pandemic. I think we all have to some extent, but you know, I talked to a therapist a little bit online, um, found like I had a, a touch of depression and then I had some anxiety, um, go figure with everything going on <laughs> in my life at the time. But, um, and, and, and with addressing this and, and realizing, you know, you know, um, you know, you know just kind of over and, and not, not necessarily hundred percent overcoming it, but certainly working towards that, um, writing what's going right in a journal entry every day is just a wonderful way of, uh, of looking, of flipping things around and looking at things more positively. So, uh, yeah. So the, what's going right journal, um, you know, uh, working out obviously and meditating too. I've been doing a lot of meditation and mindfulness using, uh, Sam Harris's app 
uh, called uh, waking up. Excellent. I, yeah, I, I like that, that philosophy of what's going right. I think that's a really powerful one. I mean, it sounds similar to the idea of gratitude or at least the idea of just reflecting on your life with the positive. I think that's, that's a really powerful tactic. Yeah. And we actually spoke about that because what Jeff was saying in that conversation was he, and he had tried and kind of failed at gratitude journal entries or thankfulness, gratitude or th- thankfulness uh, journals. And I, and I've, I've, found this too, where I've done this and it's failed as well, because you, when you try to do this, I mean, it's great to try to do this. Absolutely. But you start to realize like, you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for my dog. I'm grateful for the food. I'm (laughs) grateful for the, my, you know, electricity. And you're kind of making like a laundry list and it's like, okay. And then you do the next, I'm grateful for this. And you're, you start to realize like, yeah, this is getting old. And then you stop, uh, ultimately, um, at least this is what I, uh, what I have found for myself. And it was just interesting that he brought that up, but what's going right makes you really think more, not so much. I mean, you were obviously grateful for what's going right, but it gets you into, into a little deeper into what's going right in your life. And so I I find that that really does help. Well, even to that degree of just kind of reframing something, I know that with journaling, like as a practice, I've been in in meditation too. I tend to start and then quit and then start and then quit. And just, it never tends to stick. But Mm. on the habits that I have found that do stick are the ones where I have a perspective that I really can resonate with. I think that even the idea of reframing gratitude to what's going right, like a simple like shift like that, I mean, that could really like make something work for you long term. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like with journaling or like with meditation, the Sam Harris's app, um, the waking up app has, um, it's a 10 minute daily meditation. Now there are big, deep conversations within his app and a lot of other meditations on different topics and things like that. But at the very least, um, you know, he, he hopes that, uh, users or, or, you know, his customers or whomever, uh, will take 10 minutes And when you think about it, like 10 minutes, like you, if you can't do something for 10 minutes in a day, that's actually a good thing. You know what? Something is wrong with the way you're managing your time. Um, And I find that like, you know, we often procrastinate and, you know, we all do it. But, but when you think like 10, it's 10 minutes, what I have found, um, I've, I've done some, and I'm going to like, just, um, people are going to hate me when I say this, um, but my wife and I for many years have wanted to get a hot tub. Mm. Uh, and we finally, you know, in all the crap going on in our lives and, and things and the stresses in January of this year, we got a hot tub. Nice. And we have a screened in porch. So it kind of sits out. We hear like wind chimes and we have a, a like the woods are there and trees and stuff. And I, like, again, your listeners are like, what a jerk. I can't believe. He's... <laughs> but honestly, I, every day I get in that hot tub, I've got a smile on my face. I feel so great. And the reason why I bring this up too, and and part of like, you know, the idea of developing habits is associating things with pleasures. And so what I do now is I journal, I read, I meditate all in the hot tub. Hmm. So now, so, I mean, I'm, I like, you know, you're not supposed to be in a hot tub for more than like 20 minutes or whatever, but I'm usually in there for like an hour at least. Uh, so, so I sit in the hot tub in the morning after I've worked out, I write, I read, I meditate for 10 minutes. And so it's like this ultimate pleasure of sitting in the hot tub, but I'm knocking out stuff as well. Um, which, which, you know, helps. So associating these things that are challenging, that maybe these habits that you find that are difficult to, easy to pick up, but difficult to continue. I think when you associate them with something, you know, so if it's on the treadmill and you've got the TV in front of your treadmill, um, and you can watch whatever you want on Netflix, as long as you're walking or running at that time, you know, that's one way to do it. Or, you know, if you want to listen to a podcast like this awesome one, uh, (laughs) you know, do it when you're going for a walk instead or walking the dog instead of, you know, in the car. Um, you know, or on the treadmill, as I said. So, you know, reward yourself with, with things. And I think that helps to establish these habits. Well, yeah, I think that's a great, great suggestion to figure out how to, to make these things work and associate them with things you're already doing or things that you enjoy doing. I think yeah. that's awesome. Um, I'm definitely jealous of the hot tub. Uh, I, I, my <laughs> wife sorry. will hear this conversation later. She's going to also be jealous. Um, on that same topic, my parents who are retired now bought a hot tub. And so that's all they talk about. And so all I hear is his messaging. They're like, Jeff, 
And what else is a hot tub? And you don't. So, <laughs> well, it's fascinating too because when uh, I have a neighbor who's an electrician, and you need an electrician to wire it uh, yeah. safely and, and correctly. Um, and when he, so he came over to to help me with this. And he's like, now make sure you do this and this. And, you know, with our hot tub, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait, you have a hot tub? And he's like, yeah, yeah, we've got one in the back. It's awesome. And I was like, oh, <laughs> really? And then like another friend uh, uh, reached out. And she was like, yeah, oh, yeah, we've got a hot tub too. But honestly, I posted like one photo on social of me, like of the hot tub. Um, but I, I honestly, I waited months to post anything about it because, and I still am not doing it frequently because I'm like, <laughs> I, I recognize the fact that not everybody has a hot tub. Not everybody has a space or, or can afford one or whatever. And it's definitely a luxury. I, I absolutely agree to that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's honestly, I have absolutely zero regrets, although it's incredibly frustrating at first trying to balance the chemicals, uh, yes, that, yes. that could drive you a little crazy at first. But, uh, so if you, if you pull the trigger, let me know and I'll, I'll give you some tips. Okay. Yeah. I've heard the same complaint from my parents as well. That the chemicals is apparently a real big deal, but <laughs> it takes a while. It, honestly, there's a lot of, of trial and error and, and, and honestly, uh, yeah, uh, there's a little bit of trial and error at the very beginning. Um, but once you get it right, um, yeah, it's, it's great. So yeah, no zero regrets. So. That's awesome to hear. Well, Dave, this has been awesome today. There's a lot that I, I, I drew from this conversation. I think our listeners will as well. And I want them to, to learn more from you and obviously listen to your podcast. So where can they go to, to dig into your content? Yeah. So, um, my business is futureforth.com. So you can visit futureforth.com. Um, my speaking uh, page is Dave Delaney speaks.com. And that goes to my personal blog where you can also find the podcast. Um, the podcast is called nice podcast and it's in all the, uh, the regular places. So just do a search for nice podcast, uh, or go to nicepodcast.co and reach out to me, by the way, if you do any of the above, reach out because honestly, I love hearing from people. Um, and, and so if, if anyone, you know, reads a blog post and likes it or, you know, subscribes to my newsletter or whatever, reach out to me. Cause honestly, I always, I always love hearing from folks. That's great to hear. Yeah. All those links for our listeners this week in the show notes page. And, uh, Dave, this has been awesome. I'm so glad I got you on the podcast. Finally, it's been a long time coming. So yeah, it's been great. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And for that action step this week, connect with your best self on stage. There are many ways to communicate effectively, but one of the best ways is to break out of your shell through performance, improv, and games. You can learn so much more about being a super nice communicator by listening and following Dave's Nice Podcast. JeffSanders.com slash 396 is the place to go to get the episode notes, including links, transcriptions, and more. That's all I've got for you here on the 5 a.m. Miracle Podcast this week. Until next time, you have the power to change your life, and the fun begins bright and early.